Let's just bow our heads. Thank You, God, for reminding us of what You do. What You are doing here in our church family. What You want to do through our lives. Teach us, Lord, as we continue to explore these metaphors of faith, uh, how we can be Your instruments, how we can be filled with Your Spirit so that You can accomplish Your work here in this earth. We pray in Jesus' name. Luke 8, 4 through 8. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell upon the, along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants, still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Jesus loved to tell stories. And uh, Lucy, thank you for your story about the king who, who made all those children feel so bad because they didn't get to... Uh, but we love stories, don't we? We love stories. Jesus loved to tell stories. He, he loved to tell... a sp- especially tell stories that the people who were listening to him could relate to, things that they understood. Out of his stories come many of the metaphors of faith that we have. We've already talked about several of them, salt and light. And by the way, uh, somebody showed me, I think I mentioned this last week, maybe, the salt shaker, the light bulb salt shaker. I'm going to order some of those. Uh, Rocks, building your house on the rock. I told you about Alan's... uh, uh, construction skills and company. If in, in past uh, uh, months and years, he, if you called his phone, he would answer it and tell you about, you know, if, if it went to the message, he'd tell you to leave a message. And at the end, he would say, then remember to build your house upon a rock. <laughs> and this story, which brings us another metaphor, maybe several of them, is really one of the best of all. Here he talks to the people about food production. It's a topic of great interest to anyone living in the first century. It really should be of interest to us, but it's not because everything comes so easily to us. I don't know what he would say to us in our time that we would understand. Maybe he would say, a farmer went to the supermarket and started throwing seed around in the aisle. No, that wouldn't work, would it? The people of his day were much closer uh, to real life than we are much closer to real life than we are. Where do tomatoes come from? A package or a can on the shelf? I was making some some sauce to put on my special dish today. (laughs) And uh, uh, I had some tomatoes and then I needed more, I needed more sauce. And so there was a big can of sauce on, on the shelf in the kitchen here and I had Monty open the can and get a couple of cups of sauce. Now we have about a a gallon of sauce for anybody that wants to take it home afterwards. But but we we get our food uh, second, third, fourth, fifth hand. So many different processes that it's gone through. Uh, How about cheese or apples or even cereal? Do those things come off of the shelf? Do they come out of boxes? We only know the consumption side of the food chain, whereas most of the people in Jesus' day were involved in the entire process. They grew their own food, or they knew someone who did. They fished, they preserved and prepared. They took the food to market. They sold and bought food in a much more simple and organic form than we do today. But whether or not you really understand that milk comes from a cow or a carton, that bread originates as grain in a field and seeds in the ground, this parable takes us all back to our basic needs and the miraculous processes of growth. Planting, growing, harvesting the essential cycle of life itself. So today, uh, we're going we're gonna to explore this parable, but we're not going to really talk a lot about what Jesus said the farmer did. Because one of the things that we tend to do is we rush past some of the most important things in a story. And one of the, the most important things is not about the farmer and how he planted and how it grew, but it's about the seed. It's about the seed. And Jesus says, right at the, after telling this story, He tells him 
This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is what? The Word of God. So uh, immediately he begins to explain the parable. Well, at least he did to the disciples. Because they didn't get it. And so they said, Lord, what what are you talking about? We all know how farmers work. and We know how things grow. That wouldn't be true of us if he had told us this story. Like, oh really? I didn't know that's how it worked. This is the meaning of the parable. He says it's the meaning of the parable. The seed is the Word of God. So he doesn't immediately go into explaining about all the different things he talked about. He focuses on the seed, and that's what we're going to focus on today. The seed of the sower. I thought that was clever. Next week it's going to be the sower of the seed. The seed is a metaphor for God's Word and for His words. So we'll look at the activity of the farmer uh, next week, but today we're just going to focus on the seed. What do we know about seeds? What do we know about seeds? Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to avoid pretending that I could give you a, a proper biology lesson. Some of you here will probably be a lot better at that than I am. But there are some things we do know and that I know about seeds. Number one, seed, a seed or seeds are alive. Seed is alive. Within the seed itself is life. You could say seeds hold the secret to life. It's not just the potential or the blueprint, but a seed is literally a living thing. So, I've bought seeds over the years. I'm going to show you some in a a, a moment. And sometimes I forget to plant them and they'll go for a year or two. And even though when I, if I use those seeds to plant in my garden or when I had a garden, uh, the germination rate might not be as high as it would have been in the, in the first year, still the seeds will sprout many times. And, and most seeds will last uh, two to five years under normal circumstances if, they're, if, they're, uh, if they remain in the burpee seeds package and so forth. But I had the question in my mind, how long could a seed last and still have its potential for growing. How long would the life in a seed last? Uh, In 2002, Russian scientists claimed to have grown an arctic flower from seeds that were 33,000 years old. That's pretty old. Since that time, other scientists have said, that's baloney. (laughs) I don't know. Then I read another report that said in Turkey it was reported that lentil plants were grown from a lentil that was over 4,000 years old. They haven't really debunked that one yet, but that's pretty old. 4,000 years of lentil stew. That would be awesome, wouldn't it? We know for sure that the Israelis have demonstrated a 2,000-year-old date pit, date seed, was planted and grew a date palm. 2,000 years old, that seed had its life in it. Most garden, common garden seeds, like I said, can last two to five years under normal conditions. Or if you're worried about all this stuff going on in North Korea and other parts of the world and you want to make sure you have food you know, for the Holocaust that's coming or whatever it is, you can go down to the survivor store on Central Avenue in Upland and buy yourself hermetically sealed seeds that will last through it all, I guess. I don't know. So... Uh, I brought some seeds with me today, and I'll show you some of these on the, on the slides as well. This is a pack of basil seeds, and uh, you can see how tiny they are. They're just, they're just tiny, tiny little black seeds out of a, a pack of burpee basil, sweet basil. It's kind of like the, the big leaves. Um, Diana took the picture. For us. And then there's a picture of corn. And again, it's a pack of burpee corn seeds. You guys, you guys know about burpee seeds? When I was growing up over in Riverside, uh, next to Roar Aircraft, there was a huge burpee farm, and they, would, they used to grow the seeds there. But you order seeds from burpee catalog, and these, all kinds of different seeds. So these are corn seeds. And when you look at these seeds, either the tiny ones, or the corn seeds, they don't really look like much at all, do they? In fact, the corn seed just looks downright ugly. But in each of these seeds, every single one in both of these packs, 
is life. Is life. The life is in the seed. So it is with the Word of God. And Jesus says this in John 6.36. This was the Scripture that was read earlier. The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing, and the very words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The Word of God is life. I want you to think of it in, in relationship to what we're talking about with seeds today. So think of a promise in the Bible. Any promise that is a favorite promise of yours. I thought of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. The one that says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. It doesn't seem like a big deal. But if you take those words to heart, as millions of people have done over the millennia since they were spoken, over the thousands of years since they were spoken, those words have been a source of hope and help and guidance to millions of people ever since they were spoken. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. They're at the very core of what faith is all about. Trust. Trust in God. Letting go of our control and letting God take over. It's just one promise. So you see, in the Word of God is this, this potential, this life that as we receive it, does something inside of our minds and hearts. It moves us from doubt. It moves us from fear. It, it moves us from uh, uh, our, our self-focus to focusing on God and trusting in God and letting go of the fear and, and knowing that God is in control. God's Spirit gives life through His Word. All that we attempt, all that we desire on our own comes to nothing in the end, Jesus says. But the very words of God, the very words of Jesus contain life just like a seed contains life. So number one, seed is alive. If you don't believe me, go get a pack of tomato seeds and plant them next week and water them and see what happens. Number two, seed is full of promise or you could say potential. Potential. So I want you to think again about the basal plant. I showed you the seeds but uh, I want to show you the plant. This is a plant that I did not grow. Sprouts grew it. Or they bought it from somebody who did. But I've grown basil before. I've grown basil before. So that tiny little black seed, I don't know if you can go back to that picture or not, Yvonne. That tiny little black seed turns into a basil plant, and I've grown basil that's much bigger than this. Much bigger than this. Uh, In fact, you could say from that tiny little seed to a full-grown basil plant in the garden that takes up uh, maybe two to three feet high and it broadens out, you could say that that the basil seed uh, increases over a hundred times or hundreds of times. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a farmer plants a mustard seed in a field. We could say basil seed in a field. Although it is the smallest of all seeds, it grows larger than any garden plant and becomes a tree. Well, a better translation, it becomes a big bush. A big bush. Uh, Some of you remember Will uh, and Yolanda Brisley. And Will, uh, one time I went over to Will's house, invited me to come over because he said, do you like avocados? I said, I do. So I went over for him to give us some avocados. And he told me the story of his avocado tree. He had an avocado tree that he'd planted in his yard. It was uh, evidently a dwarf avocado. And uh, he was taking care of it, and it was growing. I think he'd had it maybe for a year. It it had gotten established. And then along came a a really hard, unexpected frost in the wintertime, and that avocado tree was taken down. But instead of um, uprooting it, they just cut it off. And lo and behold, when the weather got warmer, it started sprouting out. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew past the dwarf size. It grew bigger and bigger. And when I was there, that tree, I think, was at least 50 feet high. And it was huge. It was no more dwarf. And I don't know how many thousands of avocados it had produced over the years. All from an avocado seed. The potential is amazing. The potential is amazing. God's Word not only contains life, but it contains the potential. It contains the promise of spectacular change and growth. 
just like the zygote, the sperm and the egg that you used to be. Every single one of you were a zygote at one time. Say, what was my name when I was one month old? My name was zygote. (laughs) Just like you used to be. Maybe you can't see your way out of a certain situation. Maybe you can't see how you could possibly achieve a certain God-given dream. But God's Word, taken into our hearts, nurtured in belief, can grow into something beautiful and big. The seed is the Word, Jesus says. The seed is the Word. There's a promise in Ezekiel that says, I will give you a new heart of flesh. Do you believe it? You find yourself doing things and saying things that aren't godlike? Find yourself being hard-hearted? That's not godlike? Do you believe that God can change your heart and give you a soft and open and caring and compassionate heart? That's what the Word says. That's the seed that God's, God wants to plant in your life. There's a text in the New Testament In Philippians says, God will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Will you let that truth be planted in your heart? Or where he says so many times in the Bible, don't be afraid, I am with you. Don't be afraid, I am with you. Can you let that seed become reality? Greater things will you do than I have done. That's what Jesus said. That's a a word of Jesus that is a seed. Greater things than he did, we will do. That's what he says. Is such a thing even possible? It is. If you take God's Word into your heart and let the Spirit bring it to life. So number two, seed has great promise, great potential. Number three, seed has to be planted. Has to be planted. This didn't happen by the package looking at the pot and saying, I think I'll just hop in there. The seed had to be taken... Well, this was the wrong package anyway. That's corn. That's not corn. The seed had to be taken out of the package and put into the soil. Seed has to be planted. Ancient farmers, like the one in the story that Jesus told, scattered their seed. Uh, My gardening experience is a little different than that. I'm more used to making rows and poking holes, you know, and sometimes digging holes, depending on what you're planting. If you're planting corn, it's just a little hole. If you're planting potatoes, you've got to dig it down a ways and put straw in it and so forth. But in any case, the seed has to go out of your hand and into the soil. It takes a lot of faith to let go of the very thing that your life depends upon. Now, we don't, we don't get that at all because of our food production uh, system. in in the modern world. But in ancient times, can you imagine a family and and the father's a farmer and he's got a choice. He's he's got seed that could be food and it's coming near the end of uh, the season where they, they had enough stored up, but it's coming to the time where they have to plant again and the food's running out and he has a choice. Will I use this for food or will I use this for seed? If he uses it for seed, he has to throw it away. He has to let go of it. It has to become non-usable for his life to be sustained. You just throw it away. How can that be good? Well, if you don't throw it away, you won't grow anything. If you don't put it in the ground, if you don't let it go, you aren't going to grow anything to bring a new crop on. Again, it's about trust. If I plant a hill of zucchini seeds, in a few weeks I have a huge plant that produces scores of squash fruit. If I bury tomato or radish or corn seeds in the ground, after a time plants grow up and give me what is pictured on the package. Seed has to be planted. Seed has to be planted in the soil. God's Word has to be buried in your heart. Jesus says this in John 12, 24. Very very truly I say to you, or I tell you, reciting from old King James memory, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. David said, I've hidden your word in my heart. And it, it may seem like a simplistic thing to do when you memorize and meditate on God's Word when you take it into your heart. 
but it can have a profound and life-changing effect on you. Sharing God's Word, sharing the Gospel with others may often seem like an exercise in futility. I can tell you as a preacher, I don't even know how many sermons I've preached. Some of you may say way too many, but uh, as a preacher, having preached sermons week after week, year after year, decade after decade, there are times when I think, what's the point? It just seemed like everybody had just went over everyone's head and all they could think about was getting out, not getting anything that I had to say. Well, you know, the truth is that much of what I have to say is pretty useless, for sure. But the Word of God is never useless. And often people will say, I never thought of that verse that way. And I would think, what way? Or I'd ask them, what way? And they would tell me how they took a verse that had been used in the, in the service. And I realized, and, and brought, been brought to this realization time after time, that it isn't about what I say or don't say. It's about the Word of God. It's about what God says. It's about what Christ says and how that gets planted in our heart. I've hidden your Word in my heart, David said. And even though it might seem futile at times when we do that, the seed of God's Word will grow over time in the dark solitude of the soul. And who can say what the result will be? You guys heard of the Apostle Paul, right? Remember he used to be Saul, a member of the Sanhedrin, who hated the followers of Jesus, who went out to destroy the faith, who tried to, who arrested them and threw them in prison and many of them uh, died for their faith. That was Saul. The seed of God's Word got planted in his heart and he became Paul the Apostle, the greatest apostle. We have his writings today. We read them. We quote them. We memorize them. Anybody ever heard of uh, um, all things work together for those who love God? and For those who are called according to His purpose? That's from Paul's writings. Think of Billy Graham. He heard a preacher preach about salvation, about God's calling. He went out into the woods and began to pray. And because of what he heard, the Word of God came into his mind. He became one of the greatest preachers ever in the modern time. There's a a movie that came out earlier this year called uh, The Case for Christ. Some of you have seen that. And in that movie, it depicts the true story of the journey of a man who was uh, an avowed card-carrying atheist, his journey from being an atheist to becoming a believer. Because the Word of God got planted in his heart. Seed has to be planted. It has to be put out there. Don't ever think if you share a Bible verse or even share a word of spiritual encouragement with somebody that it's a waste of time. It's not. Number four, seed needs some things in order to grow. It needs time It needs light, it needs warmth, it needs moisture, it needs nourishment. There's no such thing as instant harvest, is there? You can't pop a watermelon seed into the microwave and have watermelons appear in 30 seconds. You can do, you can, you know, put nachos in the microwave and have, you know, good melty cheese nachos in 30 seconds, but not watermelon. And even radishes, which are known to be the fastest growing, you know, Vegetable. I always love to plant radishes. Not because I like radishes. Who likes radishes? I mean, yeah, you can raise your hand. I don't like the taste of them that much, but because they grow fast, and you plant them in, and and then in in two or three weeks, you pull them out, and here's these big old beautiful red globy things, you know. But even radishes take two to three weeks to be ready. The seed will germinate in darkness and moisture. It has its own starter food built right into the seed. So it it, it gets kick-started to sprout. But then it needs more nutrients, which it draws from the soil. That's why we use fertilizer. Uh, It it will grow uh, under warmth and light and nourishment, and it takes time to bring the seed to the maturity of the plant that it's made to be, to fruit and to ripen. So how does this work in the spiritual realm? A lot of times we think of people coming to faith because they heard a sermon or they read a Bible verse or they maybe watched a a, 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 a devotional on TV or heard it on on the internet or something. We think of it in singular ways, but 
Paul kind of describes the process in 1 Corinthians 1, 6, and 9. Each one of us did the work God gave us to do. He's talking about the people that came to, the, uh, to Corinth to share the gospel. And he says, each one of us did the work God gave us to do. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God is the one who made it grow. We are God's workers working together. You are like God's farm, God's house. The Word of God is planted in so many different ways. It can be planted through Bible study or Sabbath school discussions or, or lessons. It can be planted through Scripture songs or for, through sermons or conversations. And then it's nurtured by teaching. That's what teachers do. is They take that Word and they, they develop the verse or they develop the verse or verses and the ideas and they help you understand it so that you really begin to take it in by teaching, by meditation, where you take a verse and you think about it and you see ways that God wants that to work in your life. By application and by the light and warmth and the moisture of the Holy Spirit. There's no such thing, there's no such thing in the spiritual life as instant results. Now sometimes God performs miracles. He just accelerates the process but most of the time, 99% of the time, I dare say, he follows his own rules that he set up in the universe. Rules that apply to plants, but they also apply to people and people's hearts. There's no such thing as a microwave prayer or a stir and pour prayer. You know, God's Word, like seed, grows in its own time and it matures according to God's plan and God's blueprint. Many different people might be a part of a person's journey to faith. A part of bringing God's Word to fruition in your life. Maybe a friend. And some of you can think back in your lives how this worked. A friend, a teacher, a pastor, a worship leader. But none of these people, none of those influences, whether you read it or were told it or you discussed it, none of those people make the Word grow. God makes His Word grow. Just as surely as He makes the plant grow. And He does that through a miracle of the Holy Spirit's presence. How does a seed grow? How does a seed grow? I said earlier that a seed is like the, the, the mystery and the secret of life. And I, I believe that. How the seed grows as well as how the Word grows in our hearts is a complete mystery and a miracle at the same time. How does God's Word grow? It's a mystery and a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And then number five, seed produces exponentially. Exponentially. I looked up the meaning of that word. There were several definitions. One of them was r extremely rapid and lar large increases. So I'm not even going to get into the mathematical side of it. <laughs> Here's some peaches. Now, I wanted to bring you some of the ones that we bought from Costco yesterday because they are absolutely delicious. Perfectly ripe. Keep the blade out that way. And uh, I found some of these. Seed produces exponentially. Look at that. Let's see if it's any good. It's good. This is peach time. Don't buy peaches in June. Forget about it. They came from some foreign country and they're not ripe yet. Buy peaches in August. This is a peach pit. It's a peach seed. If you were to plant this, and I don't even know if this is plantable. I've never tried it with a peach. I've tried it with an avocado seed, as many of you have done. But if you were to plant this, and it grew up, and you nurtured it into a, a full-grown, mature peach tree, a regular-sized peach tree, the potential of this peach pit would be to produce, every year, six bushels of peaches. peaches four to six bushels. I'm going to go with the higher one, six bushels. That's approximately uh, 150 of this size peach right here. Years ago, when I lived in Oregon, every, every August we would go over the mountains into uh, the Ashland and uh, Ashland area in the, the, the south end of the Willamette Valley. And we would buy bushels of peaches 
and we would spend the next two weeks cutting and, uh, and cooking and canning peaches for the winter. Sometimes we'd can as many as 100 quarts. And we had delicious peaches all winter long. It was awesome. So, so every year, one peach tree could produce up to 900 peaches. That's a pretty extremely rapid and large increase, I'd say. That's just from one peach seed. But Jesus wasn't talking about peaches. He was talking about grain. He was talking about corn. Remember the seed. Here's one little seed. And one seed has a potential to grow one stalk. So if you plant a stalk and it's sweet corn, it could very possibly produce two ears of corn. Now how many grains uh, or kernels of corn are there in an ear of corn? If you've got two ears of corn off of a stalk, how many grains or this is a dried corn seed, but these are not dried. How many do you think there are in one ear of corn? 641. That's a pretty good guess. Anybody else? Huh? 200? There's, there's about 800. It could be 641 if you had a lot of worms on the top and you had to pop it off, you know. But about 800 kernels come from one ear of corn, and if you have two ears of corn on one stalk, you've got 1,600 kernels. Now, I doubt that you could do anything legal in the stock market that would have that kind of return. I doubt it. That is exponential return. And then, if you were to extrapolate that out, like if you're going to plant corn, well, 1,600 kernels of corn, if you just took two of the ears of your corn harvest, You'd have enough to seed to plant, I don't know, half an acre. I don't know how much, I haven't really done the math, but you know, you could figure out 12, uh, 12 feet rows, one stock every, every 12 inches, three kernels in each little hill. That's how I used to plant corn. You get a lot of corn out of two years of corn. Exponential growth. Jesus said this about the reproductive power of seed just from our story that we started out with. Some fell on good soil and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as he had planted. The Word of God, just like seed, not only has miraculous transforming effect in our lives, but it can turn uh, produce, it can turn produce into an exponential harvest. It's not just about your spiritual growth. But it's also about how God's Word works through the changes in your life to affect others. If you go back to the story of Lee Strobel, I told you about, uh, mentioned him a little bit ago. The man who was an atheist who became a, a, a believer. It was through one faithful lady, church, church attender and believer, who lived in the same uh, apartment complex as, as Lee and his wife did. And she began to, you know, uh, be friends with Lee Strobel's wife, and one day she invited her to church. I don't think she'd gone through class 401, how to share your faith. Maybe she had, I don't know, but she wasn't the kind of person that like preached to people. She invited her to come to church, and she kept inviting her until Lee's wife uh, accepted, and lo and behold, Lee's wife went to church. She heard the word of God, and she accepted Christ and became a believer. And that was not that was not a happy occasion for Lee. He was pretty upset about it. It almost brought him to divorce. But then Lee's wife began to claim the promise in Ezekiel 36, 26, the one I mentioned earlier, where God says, I will will make, give you a heart of flesh. I'll take the stony heart out of you and I will give you a heart of flesh. I'll change you. I'll transform you. She began to pray that, claim that, believe that every day for her husband. Over time, The seed of God's Word grew and matured. And eventually, Lee Strobel, if you want to know how it happened, watch the movie. An atheist, an avowed atheist, was transformed into a believer in Jesus Christ. And through Lee's testimony and through his ministry since that time, millions of people have found faith in Jesus Christ. You never know the influence that you will have because of your faith in God's Word. And that's how God's Word works. It just multiplies and multiplies and multiplies if 
Our hearts are open to receiving it. If our hearts are available to God to do His work in us so that He can grow His graces in our lives, so that He can grow His gifts in our life that He can then use to minister to other people. It's not just about our faith. It's not just about me and my overcoming the sins in my life and my finding hope and help. It's about how we share that with other people. How powerful is seed? Seed has life. Seed has promise and potential. And seed grows miraculous fruit and it produces exponentially. God's Word is even greater. It has the power to change a person from someone headed for eternal darkness to eternal life. It has the power to bring in a new world, a new healed and happy human race. That's how powerful God's Word is. When you think about all the stuff that's going on in our world today, every day the news reports it just is, is a barrage of evil and sickness and darkness and, and hurting and despair. It's, a, it, it, it's reports of tremendous fear that we may all be obliterated because somebody gets trigger happy with uh, the button, you know? God's Word has the power to eliminate all of that and to bring in the new world that Revelation promises. So, how are you receiving God's Word? How are you receiving God's Word? Here's a Bible. This is a kid's study Bible. It has cute pictures on it. Colorful cover. It's paperback. It has illustrations in it. And you might think, well, that's just for kids. Or you might not pay much attention to it at all. We have a rack out in the foyer of of Bibles that seem pretty simple and pretty plain. They don't really have any commentary or study notes in them. They're just Bibles. How do you receive God's Word when it comes to you? Whether you're reading it or someone's sharing it with you or you're listening to it in a talk or a sermon or a class. Do you, realize, do you realize what it is that you hold in your hands when you hold the Bible? The power that it has? There's a video that I found about the Bible. I want to... but we only get it when we open the Word and we take it in. Jesus said this in the, as part of this same story that we started out with. Speaking to the, to the disciples... Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. You and I have access to the power in God's Word in a way that no other generation has ever had. But do you see? Do you hear? Jesus said, let everyone who hears, who has ears, hear. Let everyone who can hear, listen and take it in. The Word of God is living seed as we allow it to be planted in the soil of our hearts. Let's pray. Lord, we as human beings have the desire for change and growth and improvement. We see it in many ways in in our societies and in our lives. But true, lasting, eternal change and true growth and true improvement comes only as the truth of Your Word gets planted deep in our hearts. And so when we think about the words that Jesus gave us, the promises that your prophets and apostles shared with us, the experiences that we have revealed in the Bible, the lessons that we can learn. When we realize what's there, help us, God, to value it like like a person who who has seed. This This is their only chance, their only hope for life. Because your word is our only chance, our only hope for real life and for an everlasting future. 
And I just pray, God, that You will help us to experience the power, the transforming, miraculous power of Your Word under the care and influence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. That we can see all kinds of fruit. That we can, we can see a harvest of people who believe, who wouldn't have believed except that we believe. Let your word sink that deeply into our hearts. We thank you for this time and we thank you for the promises that we have. We thank you in Jesus' name.